Thank you. Hey, Heather. Thank you. That was. I asked Heather just to say I was the chairman of the New York Tech Meetup, so one demerit for not listening to my suggestion. <laughs> but thank you, everybody. So I was um, listening to that panel just before, kind of, you know, getting pretty antsy in my seat because um, I think our politics are broken, and I think the way we think about it and talk about it is broken. Uh, Art, if you're still here, I don't know if Art, are you are you're still here? So Art, you said you know people don't vote in New York, uh, they don't vote across the country. The reason why people don't vote in New York is because we've been choking our public education system for 30 years, um, and if you don't have an education educated public, you don't have a major pillar of democracy. So we can be biting at the edges um, uh, to try to fix it, but we have to fundamentally rethink the fabric of society, and technology certainly can provide some of that fabric. Um, you also happen to be at the campaign finance board, so I want to tell you guys a quick story. Uh, I ran for, well, let me ask a question first. How many people in the, in the audience know who you uh, know which community board you live in? Uh, that's about 10%. How many of you know who your assemblyman is? Also about 10%. How many of you know who your state senator is? And how many of you know who your city councilman is? And how many of you know where the lines end and begin for your community boards and your council districts? So, um, how many of you have ever heard of the public advocate? And how many of you know what the public advocate actually does? <laughs> okay, I rest my case. Uh, I ran for public advocate in 2005 on a platform that would not create an office of one person trying to serve eight million people, but actually would try to connect a network of public advocates, because frankly, they exist already. There are thousands of New Yorkers who volunteer in public schools, go to community boards, jo join neighborhood associations, and uh, clean up parks on weekends, or do other myriad of civic actions, but they're not connected to each other. Um, they don't know um, about each other's work, they don't know how to lobby City, the city council, that many of them can't even attend the city council hearings, which are held at 10 o'clock in the morning, um, where most working class people can't even afford to go. So uh, when I started running, I had you know, the privilege of running for office in New York uh, in a city that had a very strong campaign finance law, which basically provided a four to one match. And I became known as the Wi-Fi guy because one of my signature platform items was this notion that the way to build public advocates network was to connect New Yorkers to each other. And with broadband costing 80 or $90 a month, it was very difficult to conceive the idea that New Yorkers could be connected to each other when 40% of its population couldn't afford to get online. Um, when I went to the New York Times editorial board for my endorsement interview, uh, I got a big fat slap of reality um, in the face because I ended up having to spend about 30 of my 45 minutes in my endorsement interview with the New York Times explaining to them what the Wi-Fi actually was. <laughs> when I ran into Mike Bloomberg on this, uh, at, a, at an election event, um, he came up to me while well, I was introduced by Ed Schuyler, his deputy mayor, and, and, and as we were talking, he said, uh, you're the Wi-Fi guy, right? I said, yes, I am, Mayor. Would we have to dig up the streets? Seriously. And the best one, actually, uh, has related to the campaign finance board. So um, for those of you who you know, know about the New York City campaign finance law, if you're a New York City resident and you make a contribution up to $250, um, that contribution can be matched now six to one uh, by the city um, to allow, you know, uh, in effect, to allow uh, candidates to be able to raise money in, in, you know, directly from the voters as opposed to from lobbyists or other special interests in a more egalitarian way. Um, one of the problems I came across when I was running was, was that even though I was collecting my donations online, um, in order to collect the money from the city, I had to enter that data into a separate database run by the Campaign Finance Board called CSMART. And literally, I had interns in my campaign typing every single donor's name, address, occupation, um, and amount of donation one letter at a time into that database. Um, I was the only uh, candidate at the time who had a technologist working on our campaign. In fact, we even created uh, this, just a quick aside, a, 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 an ability to take a picture of a pothole with, a, with your cell phone and be able to post it on a Google map uh, as an example of, of how technology could make the world a better place. And he quickly wrote a program that allowed our staff to just basically port over all our data 
onto the C-SMART program. Um, basically a typing program that entered the data. We sent it in. As soon as we were done, we printed up the program and I distributed it to every single candidate running for office. In fact, I called Betsy Gottbaum, who was my opponent and the public advocate at the time, and said, Betsy, I'm sending over a CD that will make it easy for you to, to enter your donor information for the C-SMART program. And she said on the phone, she says, why are you doing this? And I said, because you'll have more time to talk to constituents. And she says, there's no way I would touch a piece of software given to me by you. <laughs> and I said, well, I'm sorry, but you know, it, it, it's for the betterment of democracy. Isn't that, isn't that what we're all fighting for? And she goes, yeah, but it, I, I don't believe the technology makes it possible for me to be able to spend more time with my constituents, which was basically my argument. So I sent it around to everyone else, and I got a letter from the Campaign Finance Board and a letter that was sent to every single candidate in New York st stating that anybody who used Roche's um, program would be voided from the Campaign Finance Program. And when I protested and asked for a meeting to explain that the technology didn't actually touch any of the software at the Campaign Finance Board, I was rebuffed. They refused to meet with me. And um, I ended up um, publishing the software online for anybody who was willing to take the risk. The name of the program, by the way, was Be Smarter. Um, anyway, the reason I'm telling you that story is to, is to illustrate the fact that we have a massive, massive disconnect between the politics of the 20th century and the politics of the 21st. Um, I want to kill the term government 2.0. That term should be banned. We don't need a second generation government. We don't need an e-government. What we need is a we government. And a we government is not government agencies using technology that we use every day. It's government agencies publishing data about what they do. It's about citizens collecting data from every day of their waking lives and people building tools, applications, and services and platforms that are useful for people that make the world a better place. Government is not the solution. People are the solution. And what we're seeing today is that the technology is getting robust enough that people are beginning to build these tools faster and better than any government agency could ever possibly build. Um, how many of you have ever heard of Yushahidi? So quickly, Yushahidi was a platform that was built in the 2007 Kenyan elections where the election was disputed, the government started to crack down on protests uh, against the government and, the, and the, what was perceived as a stolen election. But because the mainstream media in Kenya was not reporting on those protests because they were uh, controlled by the government, a young woman by the name of Ori Okolo uh, and a few other technologists in Kenya built a site called Ushahidi, which basically means witness in Swahili, which allowed citizens to post incidents of violence on a map, instantly putting it on Google. And the Ushahidi map not only exposed the violence, but allowed international uh, eyeballs to see what was going on and they put uh, diplomatic pressure on the government of Kenya to stop the violence. But the thing that was so amazing about the Ushahidi was not only did it stop the violence uh, in the Kenyan election, it didn't turn the election back yet, but what it, what it did was, was it, it built its platform on an open, in an open, on an open source manner that now Ushahidi has become the de facto crisis mapping tool and in fact mapping tool for all kinds of open mapping projects all around the world. Uh, the Haiti crisis, for example, the earthquake crisis, was mapped on Ushahidi maps. Um, and in fact, FEMA now uses Ushahidi maps for crisis mapping. And in fact, Ushahidi maps were used in Washington and New York in recent snowstorms to help people find parking places. Ushahidi is not a government platform. It is a citizen platform. And it's an example of what I call we government. Another one is exit strategy. How many of you use the New York City subway? How many of you have an iPhone or an Android phone? Well, there is a, in fact, I think it's even available on BlackBerry. There's a, plat a tool called exit strategy. I use it all the time. Basically, it's a real simple tool. You get on a, get on a train, you, you click where you're going. It will tell you where to stand on the platform so that when you get off the train, the stairway is right in front of you. Now, you would think that that would have been built by the MTA, 
It wasn't. It was built by a brother sister team in Brooklyn who have sold that program about 250,000 times for $1.99, um, making them relatively wealthy. Um, that's another example of we government. Or how many of you have heard of Open Congress? So for those of you interested in law and, and legislation, you probably know about Thomas, which is the federal government's platform for legislation and, and the, on, uh, the ongoing um, largesse in, in, um, in Congress. Well, you should take a look at Open Congress, which was a platform that was built through funding of the Sunlight Foundation, uh, full disclosure, I'm a, a, an advisor, that allows citizens to be able to read bills, comment on bills, share information, and in, to some degree um, help write the legislation. Um, there are lots and lots of these examples. See, click, fix, which is basically a tool that allows to citizens to do the same thing that that uh, I had mentioned earlier, which take pictures of broken infrastructure and post it on a map. It's now being used by something like 40,000 cities um, as a citizen reporting tool. Um, CabSense, which is a tool that was built by a company here called Sense Networks that took three years of taxi and limousine data and based on the time of day and where you're located in Manhattan, it will tell you which corner you should stand on where you're more likely to catch a cab. Um, those are all cute and nice and helpful, but they portend something bigger. Um, it was said in a panel earlier that uh, SOPA and PIPA was a milestone event and uh, we were able to say no. Um, it's a lot easier to say no to something than it is to say yes. So the challenge for all of you and the challenge for our democracy is how we move from saying no to saying yes. How do we build things that matter? How do we get beyond the usual bullshit that we deal with in Congress and in our local politics, where ideology and the corruption of money and influence in politics has distorted our democracy beyond uh, uh, comprehension, uh, and certainly beyond the comprehension of, or the intent of our founding fathers and when they built what they thought was going to be the, uh, a, a true representative democracy. So, I don't want to take up too much time, but I'm going to give you a, a story, give you a story and an idea about how this, what is going to happen next. Um, there is an emerging internet public. It wasn't the software industry or the technology industry that fought back on SOPA PIPA. It was the internet public. Yes, there was a lot of groundwork laid by think tank organizations like the ones represented on our panel. There was a lot of work done by Google behind the scenes where Google had laid a lot of the groundwork for some of the funding of the activism, including engine advocacy. Um, and in fact, Google was, uh, you know, could be, could be argued was doing its own kind of lobbying using money and influence, but not the one that usually seen in the halls of Congress. But when the New York Tech Meetup got involved in the process of SOPA and PIPA, uh, we called our senators, Gillibrand and Schumer, and basically complained about their support of the bill, and we were told by their aides that they were working behind the scenes to adjust the bill so that it wouldn't be as egregious to the New York Tech community, which many of you know is experiencing a renaissance. And uh, at some point, the progression of the bill got to the point where, where in the Senate it was going towards the cloture vote, and both Gillibrand and Schumer, at my request, refused to uh, withdraw their support of the bill, even though there was no more time for amendments. And so we sent an email to our membership, 20,000, and within three days, 2,000 of our members signed a pledge to show up in front of Gillibrand and Schumer's offices. And in fact, three days later on January 18th, the day of the, of the blackout, 1,700 of them actually showed up. Um, it was a remarkable display of technology's ability to organize people, and I will also tell you that we did not get one single email back from one of our members questioning our motives, telling us it was silly, questioning SOPA or PIPA, um, and there wasn't a single tweet or any other evidence that people were against the protest. But the reason I'm telling you this story is what happened afterwards. Afterwards, I got a phone call from Chuck Schumer basically apologizing and saying, I didn't see this coming, you guys are right, I need to understand this. Could you please set up a meeting with some members of your community? I'd like to figure out what's going on and understand this. 
And so he came down to Soho, met at Scott Heiferman's meetup offices with 15 or so assembled folks that were active in the, pro in the project, in, a, in the process of the protests. And he spent three hours leaning forward at his desk, listening, asking questions, and assigning tasks to his staff to follow up on a series of examples that were provided by the people assembled about how this isn't about SOPA and PIPA. This is about wave after wave of incumbent interests who are going to use their ability to use money and influence in Congress to try to put the genie back in the bottle and uh, protect their markets, stifling innovation and stifling the opportunity for the United States to participate in a global 21st century economy. And Chuck got it. He wasn't asking who's going to give me money. He, he's, he, by the way, he is by far one of the most successful fundraisers and political uh, currency uh, traders in the world. But he understood that there was a new currency that was born out of the SOPA PIPA battle that he could see, feel, and taste, which is a currency of networks, the currency of trust, the currency of openness. And he wanted to understand it. And in fact, afterwards, towards the end of the meeting, he said, maybe if you guys learn, uh, believe that I get this, you'll help me and push some buttons so we can take down Citizens United. I mean, his thought of it was that we push some buttons. But at least he understood that there was a new political order. On the other hand, Kirsten Gillibrand didn't call me. She called Fred Wilson, who is a VC in New York, very well known, who has been a contributor to her campaign, and asked him to arrange a similar meeting. And when uh, Fred called me, invited me to the meeting, and uh, she came down, she brought one of her legislative aides, but the interesting thing was, was that she also brought her fundraiser, who by the way worked for me when I was running for office. His name was Ross Offinger. And it was shocking to me that in her mind, her fundraiser was somehow part of the discussion about what happened. Um, and her ability to understand what was a little different than Chuck's. In fact, we gave her an example of Craigslist as an example of disintermediating technology. And she threw up her hands angrily and said, don't mention Craigslist to me. Don't, I don't even want to talk about Craigslist. We were shocked and surprised. And she said, they traffic in women. <laughs> and I tried to explain to her that Craig Newmark doesn't traffic in women. <laughs> uh, and she acknowledged that her words may have been a little bit too forceful, but her understanding of the fact that the technology, um, how the technology works was shocking to me. She's 44 years old. She's a major US senator. Uh, she represents a city that's experiencing a technological boom. And she doesn't understand what's, what's going on. So here's the big idea. The New York City mayor's race is coming up in 2013. And Art's right, very few people vote. In fact, I would argue that the next mayor of New York is going to be a Democrat, um, because 85% of the city is Democratic. Uh, we've had Republican mayors for 20 years in New York, but really under, you know, it's really an anomaly. Um, Giuliani ran twice, lost the first time. Uh, he was already a well-established name as an attorney, district attorney. Uh, federal district attorney, but when he ran a second time, he ran on an anti-crime campaign against a somewhat depleted and feckless mayor by the name of David Dinkins, and managed to win by just a few points. Cum laude, grad. <laughs> Transparency is good, right? <laughs> and then uh, was basically, you know, had the lowest approval rating, went on September 11th. I don't know if how many of you remember this, but the, the S September 11, 2001 was primary day in New York, and a gentleman by the name of Mark Green, who had been public advocate, was running for mayor, and it was pretty clear that Mark was going to clearly win the, the nomination on that day. The primary was canceled. Uh, Mark ended up uh, screwing up his campaign a little bit by suggesting that Giuliani get a three-month extension, a resurrected Giuliani with a 90% approval rating getting res you know, an extension. And, um, and then Mike Bloomberg spent $73 million and with a 90% approval mayor endorsing him, Ruth Giuliani, distributed VHS tapes to every single voter of that endorsement 
a week before the election, and he beat Mark Green by one point. And for the last 12 years, he successfully managed to uh, run the city and, 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 and be reelected, somewhat disputedly in the last election because of term limits. But there, isn't, there is not going to be a 90 or, I mean, 70 or $80 billion spending billionaire running on the Republican line, and there will um, not be a 90% approval rating mayor endorsing that candidate. So whoever wins the Democratic primary is most likely going to be mayor. But here's the really bad news about our democracy. Only about five or 600,000 people vote in a Democratic primary. And you need 40% in order to win the primary. So if you can figure out a way to get 200 or 250,000 people to show up on election day, primary day in New York, you get to elect your own mayor. So imagine if the same ethos, the same people who understand what, how technology was used to facilitate organizing protests of the Arab Spring, how technology can be used to facilitate the protests of Occupy Wall Street or the Tea Party movement, if the same people who use technology who fought back Susan G. Komen on the banning of donations to Planned Parenthood, um, or those who fought the Sopa Pippa battle, Imagine if they were to organize themselves in New York and put forth a platform to make New York City the most wired city in the world, a city where entrepreneurs and technologists flock in order to participate in the 21st century economy, a city where every single public school student has access to the internet at a low cost, like $10 a month, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, rather than the $70 or $80 that they're paying now. Imagine a city where we don't have a, an open data bill that takes five years to implement with city agencies who don't even understand what data they collect in order to comply, but a city that actually publishes all its data, recognizing that public data belongs in the hands of the public who own it. And imagine a New York City where the city of New York elects someone to be a leader or a slate of leaders because all the positions that uh, that person may want to uh, work with are identified before the election as opposed to after, paves a path for a democracy that's not based on money, not based on the influence of, of lobbyists, but is based on the ability of people to connect with each other, to turn towards each other, to rebuild a fabric of a society that's not waiting for an e-government to deliver some services, but actually recognizes that it's a partner with the public building something in the 21st called we government. Thank you very much. Andrew O'Shea, folks.